And I overheard this conversation and boy, did it hit home. Cause I was gonna say, well, you know what? I'm gonna be sure that you change what you just said about me before I leave this band. I wanted to make Bob proud of me. I thought, oh, a challenge. Greetings, everybody. I'm really happy to have you here with me for another episode of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. This is Keith Billick. How are y'all doing? I am doing excellent, and I'm uh, proud to announce that it's it's a heavy news day at Picky Fingers HQ. It's been quite a while since I had things, uh, you know, announcements and, and things that I'm doing to share with you. So l- let me give you a rundown. Well, I had a, a really cool weekend, went to the Hoxieville Music Festival, and it was kind of a Picky Fingers reunion of sorts. I got to check out Billy Failing playing with Billy Strings, of course, Wes Corbett playing with the Sam Bush Band, I saw Lloyd Douglas playing with Full Chord, and perhaps even more importantly, got to hang out with some of my favorite people and favorite musicians from the Lindsay Lou Band and the Sweetwater Warblers, and all of these people sounded amazing, of course. But I mentioned I had some other things coming up, so check this out. I was invited to go to Dell Fest this uh, September, and that's going to be the 23rd through 26th, and set up a podcasting booth uh, in the backstage area. So I expect to have some updates for you about that. But anybody who's going to Dell Fest, feel free to give me a shout, and hopefully I can say hi to you there and uh, give you a sticker or something like that. Uh, the following week, I am heading down to IBMA, where I will have an exhibit booth at the convention hall. So again, come by, say hi. I'll be slinging those Picky Fingers t-shirts that you see all the cool kids wearing. So you'll have an opportunity to, yeah, do, do all of that. And another really cool thing about both Dell Fest and IBMA is that I will be there uh, in both cases podcasting with my brother in, in arms and in pics, uh, my podcasting friend, Daniel Patrick. He does the Mandolins and Beer podcast, which if you listen to this podcast, but you also enjoy mandolin, he kind of has the mandolin version of the Picky Fingers podcast. So check him out, Mandolins and Beer, and Dan's going to be my wingman for Del Fest and IBMA. And then the following weekend after that, I will be once again going to one of my favorite music camps to uh, instruct the campers in the ways of banjo. And I'm talking now about the Great Lakes Music Camp, which is highly recommended. It's always one of my favorite weekends of the year. Uh, Last year, in in a year full of disappointments, that was maybe one of the bigger disappointments that I didn't go to Great Lakes. But uh, the instructor staff that they have there is is simply amazing. A lot of people will be familiar to you, such as Bill Evans and Clark Wyatt from the podcast, but a lot of other legends of their instruments, such as Mike Compton, Daryl Anger, Missy Rains, and, you know, Bruce Molsky, a whole bunch of people. Uh, very impressive, and I'm honored and flattered to even be, uh, you know, sh- be able to show my face in that place with all those talented musicians. You can check into that at greatlakesmusic.org, and I hope to see a few of you, if not at uh, Great Lakes Music Camp, maybe at Delfest, maybe at IBMA, or maybe at the upcoming Picky Fingers VIP Lounge for very important pickers of the podcast. That is actually coming up next week, August 25th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. The VIP Lounge is a group video chat where we... Uh, all join together, banjos in hands, and uh, just chat about whatever is on our mind. And we usually get on some really cool topics and and really important music conversations. So uh, how do you get invited to this VIP lounge, you might ask? Well, here is exactly how you do it. You go to patreon.com slash banjo podcast. You become a patron of the show and make sure you look for the ones the, the tiers that have the rewards of uh, VIP Lounge. So uh, not only do you get to hang out with me and your fellow listeners in the video chat, but you also get to support this show, which is something that I, I greatly appreciate and could absolutely not uh, be doing this without the support of the patrons. So once again, patreon.com slash banjo podcast. 
And of course, now is when I acknowledge and thank today's very special Patreon supporter. Today's patron of the show is Banjo Ben Clark, which many of you will, of course, recognize his name. He's one of the top instructors online for basically all the bluegrass instruments. So, Ben, I am very honored to have your support. Thank you so much for contributing to the show. And one more time, that's patreon.com slash banjo podcast. You can contact the show at pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com for all of your questions, comments, concerns, etc. featured guest is Steve Huber of Huber Banjos. I felt like I could have done three completely separate interviews with Steve because he he really is a triple threat in the banjo world. For one thing, he is a killer player and I would love to talk to him, you know, ju- just about his his playing and all that. He also happens to be one of the most respected experts on pre-war Gibson banjos, both the the history and evaluation and appraisals of these holy grail old Gibson instruments. So that, of course, is a whole nother world that would be really interesting to hear from him about. And lastly, his, his main gig now is as owner of Huber Banjo Company. So he makes some of the top banjos you can buy today. And, and of course, I love digging into that with him too. So we did have a lot to talk about and he was very generous with his time. So as a result, this is going to be only part one of a two-part episode. You'll, you'll have to wait a little bit for the second half. But in this one, we get into his uh, background playing with some of his professional bands and some of the evolution of Huber's tone ring designs. So it's fascinating. I can't wait for you to hear this, and I really can't wait for you to hear the next one either. He's a wealth of information and a terrific player and a great guy. So here it is, Steve Huber. So I started playing when I was 14, and we went over to a friend's house during Christmas, one of these friends that you only see once a year, mm. right? And let's go over. And, so we go over, and they say to their son, hey, Bill, get your banjo out and play for us. Okay, Bill's like, oh, no, I have to, right? So he gets his banjo out, and he plays the Beverly Hillbillies theme, okay. Ballad J. Clampett. And I'm just like, wow, because I'm watching this How show. old is uh, little so, Steve 14, Huber? I'm 14. 14, right? okay. So I'm watching the Beverly Hillbillies, and I love the music, but I don't yeah. know Earl Scruggs from... Earl Scheib at the moment, right? And uh, he plays this thing, and I'm thinking, now that's just too cool. How do you do that? Well, here. So he writes down some rolls on a piece of paper, right? Yeah. Right. Thumb, middle index, we're in three, two, one, blah, blah, blah. Here's some picks, and here's a Framus banjo that I don't play anymore. And uh, which he sent to me about six years ago, so I could so I could hang it up. In you the, have the exact I, one. I have the one I started on. Yeah. So. Uh, and so that's so I went home and I just did these rolls on this on this Framus and I couldn't put it down. It was just it was so at that point in my life it was basketball and it was banjo and that was it. Uh-huh. So we had a barn, we were on a small farm. Dad took half the barn, made a little basketball court out of it. Yeah. So I was there all the time or I was playing banjo and constantly getting in trouble with mom and dad because I didn't do anything else, you know, <laughs> including like, homework in, and chores, homework, and chores, <laughs> you name it. I was, I was playing basketball. I was playing banjo and uh, I get tired of one and I go do the other and back and forth. That's how I got started. And then it was, um, you know, this was in 74. So, and where, where is this? And this, that is, this is all happening. This is uh, Southern Lancaster County, uh, in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Yeah. Southern end of the County. We lived down, so, so I practiced, I mean, I just did this, I was ate up with it. And there was a little band called the High Ridge Mountain Boys. Okay. 
I'm not going to say how good they were. They were local. Let's just keep it at that. Okay. So I'm just learning. I'm a year into this. I'm playing a little bit. And they say, hey, play with us, right? Uh That was the best thing ever could have happened to me. Even though none of the guys were pros, but they loved it, right? And it was in a band situation. And I'm in this... I'm in this band at the time after playing a year, maybe less, and it was really, really good and and fun. And so it kept it fun, yeah. right? And it kept kept me into it and then just various bands over the years, you know, here and there. But uh, That's a pretty common thing for people to say that that's, that's when they made a big leap was when they were able to start mm-hmm. either playing with bands or, or finding other people to pick with. Oh, absolutely. What do you think it is about having that opportunity that helps you grow as a player? Well, I think some of it's the just the excitement that you're going to play with other people. Uh-huh. All right, so you may, not, you may not play for a week if you didn't have other people to play with. You may not play for three weeks, right? But you've got guys you're playing with and you're meeting every week, you're meeting twice a week. I mean, some of the bands that I ended up getting in before I graduated high school, I mean, we'd rehearse three times a week just because we were all local and we could and we loved it. Right. right? So that's a big part of it. Timing's, timing's a big part of it too. But, but I just think the fact that you're playing and it's exciting and you got other guys and you can work up a song. So we didn't, you know, I didn't have YouTube, right? I wanted right. to learn a break. And I was, I guess, at the end of this, but I still remember putting, uh, putting the record player on and playing a, playing a Jimmy Martin song, mm-hmm. learning a banjo break over and over and over by just lifting up the needle. And then I figured out, hey, I could record this on my little cassette recorder. Then I could just go <laughs> back and forth on the cassette recorder. Yeah, a little simpler. You know, and, and Were you I, doing the half-speed record? Oh, yeah. Uh, 16? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, I, absolutely. And the, you know, the Earl Scruggs record and, and all that. Um, yeah, who so. were the, the main players? You said, I mean, obviously... Ballad of Jed Clampett, so Earl's in there. Yeah, Earl's. Jimmy Martin, so you're hearing, what, J.D. Crow or Bill Emerson or exactly. something? Exactly, J.D. Crow or Bill, I'm hearing that. And I'm not necessarily saying I actually knew who it was, but I knew I liked the play. And, yeah. it was, um, uh, and as time went on, um, I mean, J.D. Crow, I could, I could see J.D. Crow play. I went to see Earl Scruggs' review one time, and they, did, and they didn't show up. It was a no-show. Oh, no kidding. So back when I was young, but... I went to the um, Crazy Horse Campground Festival, I think, in 75, and that's when Glenn Lawson had just joined Crow. So I got to see that. That was my first mm-hmm. festival. So I got to see Crow with Lawson, the country gentleman, seldom seen, still have pictures of the festival, and seldom seen her on two mics, right, uh-huh. and just just brought the house down. So other than your, your local-type bluegrass, was this your first time even seeing live yes. uh, banjo yes. of yeah. any kind? Yeah, 75. Yep. Went and, and, uh, and saw... Um, uh, and the seldom the seldom scene got to be when I in, in seventy five after I saw that show, I could see them because I was in the Southern Pennsylvania area, and they were you know down in yeah. D.C. area, and they would come up quite a bit to Pennsylvania and around Maryland to play. Um, so I I watched Ben Ben got to be one of my favorite well my favorite banjo player for a while. It was Earl Crow and Ben Eldridge, and I, I remember uh, they put out a record. I'd just learn all Ben's licks. I just loved that Do you remember any of the, the, the ones that you really dug or I any of his pieces? I licks? only have one lick that I... <laughs> you want to hear it? Yeah. That I remember. It's easy. Well, that I do, that I just... I associate that you with, got from Ben? With Ben is, is just when you're playing a four, playing a C. 
right? Uh-huh. That's just little. That's something. It's easy. That's probably why I remember it because it's easy. Yeah. You know, and it's just. But he he do that like a lot. I mean, Earl was always Earl, right? I just couldn't go see Earl, but I could go see Ben. I could go see JD at yeah. festivals. Eventually, I joined up with Bob Paisley. Then we were playing a lot with the Seldom Scene. We'd just get these gigs. We were, and and Ben and I got to be really good friends. He ended up playing one of my banjos for a while. Oh, and, cool. And, we, and he just what a sweet, sweet man. What yeah. a, a great banjo player, a, a great man. So uh, that was fun. So yeah. it sounds like you were mostly teaching yourself, just learning off of records and picking up what it, you could from other players. It was. I had a, I had a, a guy give me lessons. I, I'm not going to... Caldwell? Maybe his name was John Caldwell, not sure. But he was in Lancaster. He played he played fiddle, mandolin, banjo, guitar, taught mm-hmm. them all. Yeah. So I had about four or five lessons with him, and he said, okay, um, you you got all I'm going to show you. Just retab yeah, yeah. and just do that. And then I got a guy, I went to a guy who was a wonderful teacher, wonderful influence. His name's John Farmer. Boy, he was a good player. Hmm. And he says, you know what? We got to change your right hand. So what? He goes, yeah, you got to drop your thumb on the second string when you're playing Foggy Mountain Breakdown Roll. Okay. I you, said, what? You were twiddling the uh-huh. index and middles? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I said, really? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, you got to do it. So there I am playing about a year, and I have the book, but I never... It, it never occurred to me. I never looked right. close enough that he, that he was dropping the thumb. Why, why would so, you do that when you have the two top strings? So was, That's what ex- those fingers exactly, are for. <laughs> exactly. So uh, John, John was great. So I took, I took lessons from John for quite a while because he, he had some really cool songs that weren't bluegrass that he could play but sounded like it, and then all the standard stuff he could play. And just a real good influence. Real, I really appreciated that. Do you remember any other techniques or ideas or breakthroughs maybe similar to the dropping the thumb down that really helped you advance a lot as a player i remember getting excited about uh this is kind of a neat little story i didn't have the scruggs book yet but i believe i had the bluegrass banjo book by peter wernick is that mm-hmm. right? Is that what that was called? Yeah. It was a white book. It's just yeah. Bluegrass Banjo. That's the, the, the title. Banjo. Yeah. So I remember having that, looking looking through that, and I didn't pick up the Scruggs book yet, but I was listening to Scruggs. Okay. So I heard this lick. We all know it. No big deal. Okay. So I hear that lick to whatever I'm listening to, and I, I, don't, know, I don't know why I remember this, but I don't know how they did I couldn't figure it out. Yeah. How are they doing that? And I'm trying to piece it together, but I'm not piecing it together right. So I, so I, I live just, you know, 15 minutes from Shindig in the barn, which back then was huge. Lewis family, all the, you know, Osborne brothers. Is that a concert venue? Uh, it's I, a, I'm it's, not familiar. It's just a little, almost a barn, but they have a stage, they had seats, and it was just for music. Mm-hmm. It was called Shindig in the barn. Pretty famous, actually. I mean, all the, all the acts at the time, Crow would go th- come through only once in a while, but... A lot of the time, it was Jim and Jesse, the Lewis family, Ralph Stanley, uh, Osborne Brothers. A lot of the main so, touring groups. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was an it was an Amish Mennonite area where I grew up, uh-huh. and uh, the Amish and the Mennonite folks loved the show that Little Roy would put on. Oh, I bet, and I did too. Yeah, I mean, it was it was <laughs> fabulous uh, at the time. It was it was it was just great. So, so I go to one of the shows, and <laughs> there's a band. They got a heck of a title for the or a name for the band, the Four Ounces of Grass. Okay, <laughs> yeah, very good. So they're the band, and this guy's playing. Right, I hear it, and you, yeah, and and I'm thinking he's doing it, he's doing it. So <laughs> I'm watching, to the stage. <laughs> and I'm watching, and as soon as they're done, yeah, I'm up to the stage, <laughs> and that guy says, "Yeah, you just do this, you're right." And I'm like, yeah. "Oh my gosh, it was so easy, and I couldn't figure it out." And that I just I'll never forget that that yeah. just that little lick, you know, was. That's so cool. So, but I don't, uh, as far as your question goes, as we can get to this like maybe a little later, but I think one of the main influential things that happened with me that I wouldn't trade for a, a million bucks was getting hired to play with Bob Paisley in the Southern Grass. I was, I was just about to just, ask how that happened. That, that's, uh, so, you know, I, ha- I played in uh, little bands up until I was going to um, a trade school. I got a basketball scholarship at this trade school, and I ended up picking the trade I wanted to do was machining. 
Yeah. So, and I got this scholarship, which was basically, uh, well, you can, we'll let you come to the school and you can pick what trade you want. That was a scholarship. There's no money involved, but mm-hmm. there were so many people wanted into that school at the time. So that's where I started my, my machining and played basketball. There. And then I was just playing for, uh, had a couple little little bands. The uh, played with a band called the Summers and Mountain Boys. The Five Strings of Bluegrass that was up through tenth, eleventh grade. Penn Central that was great to play with a guy named Mark Rickert. He taught me so much about harmony singing. Huh. Um, he was really good at that. Um, I take it by your voice. You're doing the baritone I'm parts. Doing, I'm doing the... baritone. Yeah, you, you can. I, <laughs> if you're listening to me, you can barely you can bear the tone. Okay, that's about my baritone. Right. It's, it's, <laughs> you can it, bear the... it's it's okay, yeah. but it's it's not. I'd hate to know what they think of mine. <laughs> so, so, uh, and then I got a call. I guess I think it was '86. I was walking out the door, and I was married at the t- time. And I was walking out the door, and my wife said, uh, "Hey, you got a phone call?" And I says, "Yeah, but I'm late." I remember that she says, "It's Bob Paisley." I said, "Oh, oh." So I can I be get, late. Yeah, I can be late. I go back to the phone, and he we set up a rehearsal. And I get that gig, and the first thing we do is fly to Europe for a month. One of the very first. I, we might have played a show or two, but that was that was the first thing we do. Jumping right in the deep end. Jumping right in, and uh, so I'm still playing melodics, some kind of a Ben Eldridge, Ben Eldridge, and still still doing, uh, you know. And I would play, maybe I'd play um, Turkey in the Straw. You know, I was playing that kind of melodic stuff at the yeah. time, and and really liking it. And we were over, we were over there, and I don't think I've ever told Danny Paisley this story. So, <laughs> Dan, I'm, you're probably not listening, but if you are, this will be the first. We'll time make sure he does. You now. heard it. Uh, so I was over there, and I heard uh, Dan say, "Well, Dad, what do you think of uh, what do you think of Steve?" And Bob said, "Well, he's." Uh, yeah, he's okay. He's no Ted Lundy. Uh-huh. Okay, well, it was Bob Paisley and Ted Lundy way back in the day, and yeah. Ted, Ted was straight-ahead player, great player, balls to the wall, straight-ahead player. And I overheard this conversation, and boy, did it hit home, because I was going to say, well, you know what? I'm going to be sure that you change what you just said about me before I leave this band. And it wasn't so much that I, I don't really know what what it was. I wanted I wanted to make Bob proud of me, and yeah. I don't think it was that I said to myself, um, "No, I like what I'm playing. You either put up with it right. or you can let me go." It. I never thought that. I thought, "Oh, a challenge, right? A yeah. challenge." So I just started playing straight, just because the guy that hired me that's what he liked, that's what he wanted, and it was a challenge, mm-hmm. just to and and uh that's what i did and it's kind of where it's st- where the where i i'm nothing against any style of banjo playing i mean i love it all and and these guys you know this single string and the melodics of these guys playing today is just absolutely magic in- yeah. incredible <laughs> and but i just stayed i kind of got back i wouldn't say back maybe i was never there like that straight ahead but i just said man i'm going to play Crow. I'm going to play this. You can say Scruggs. You're never going to play like Earl Scruggs. I don't care who you are, what you think, how good you are. You're not going to play like Earl Scruggs, right? It's just his right hand and and the way he attacked it. But that style, and that's what I, that's what I decided to do. Do you remember what specifically you did to try to achieve that goal you set for yourself? Yeah, I just I. Well, it was really I just took took out the melodics. Really, okay. I just stopped. I just. You know, I was over, I mean, we were over in Europe, and the first thing I did was I just stopped putting so many, you know, I wouldn't end a break. I just stopped doing that, okay, I, and, and just stayed with, with rolling, rolling and, and whatever, excuse me, whatever else you do. And that was the first thing I did. And then, you know, I don't know, that might have saved me from, you know, I, I stayed with them until 19, from 86 to, to 91, so maybe that decision kept me in the band. I don't know. You know, sounds but, like it. But that's it, a likely it, thing. It may have. But what I learned is timing. You had Dad and his two boys. So you had Bob, you had Danny on guitar, and you had Michael on bass. 
and it was a human trio metronome like you cannot believe. Mm-hmm. The timing was unbelievable. And you could, you know, once I got learning it and I, you know, I didn't just jump in and say, oh, I, I can play like that. I mean, it took time and yeah. I don't really know how long, but I remember as time went on, you could just put your right hand on autopilot literally and just not even think about playing in time. You just, you just were, you were just right there. Mm-hmm. And it was the same thing with Kenny and Amanda Smith when I was with them. I mean, Kenny's just a human metronome. Yeah. And I just loved playing with Kenny Smith, still do. Right. The guy is just, he's just incredible. And that was good times. One of my, uh, are you familiar with Takes Bluegrass channel on YouTube? You no. know what I'm talking about? No, I'm done. Oh, man. Huh. This is a bit of a tangent, but there's this Japanese dude on YouTube, and his whole deal is he puts up all these out of print bluegrass albums on YouTube, and it's a gold mine. And one of my. You could, I could spend the rest of my life listening to his channel and I wouldn't get through them all. He's just got everything out on there. And one of my favorite recent finds was uh, No Vacancy. Oh, really? And, <laughs> and, and he's really good about putting the credits on there, too. Yeah. So, of course, I'm like, well, who's this on banjo? Oh, I'll yeah. be damned. Yeah. I didn't, didn't realize that. No Vacancy. Was. Gosh. No Vacancy. No Vacancy. No Vacancy. No Vacancy. Oh, then the line is same old sign wait for me. I'm going to have to get that because I haven't listened to that album for probably 20 years. Make sure before. I don't even remember what. <laughs> Anything about I got it, it on my phone. We could play it right now. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, How about that? No, it, is, it sounds great, and it was it was great enough to catch my ear and make me, who is no this? No kidding. Yeah, it was great, man. Wow. Boy, I haven't, boy, that's a blast from the past right Well, <laughs> even beyond that, you just need to check out yeah. that channel. You, yeah, I will. Uh, I mean, so to my ears, yeah, you, you talked about locking in your playing, but something I identify with your style is, you know, it's it's obviously traditional based, but you have just a great deal of funkiness and bounce, and and you're you seem to be really talented at bringing out those melody notes in a strong way. Can you hmm. can you remember anything that you worked on to help develop that, or is, is there an approach you took? Uh, yeah, well, just thinking about it now, there, I think there was, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure it was my idea, but when I was with Bob, you play the melody, mm-hmm. period. You know, you just play the melody of, of the, and I'm not so sure, I don't think Bob ever said, hey, Steve, play the melody of this song or you're fired. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, and I really don't remember, but I remember hearing maybe Scruggs mentioned about you know, keeping the melody in the song and trying to stay with, I I really, I really don't think there was just one defining, but I know, see, I started, I, I, I started writing stuff for the Pulling Time record when I was still with Bob Paisley. And if I, I remember thinking, and I still believe this today, if I can't whistle this tune, then I'm not writing it. Okay, it's got you've got to have a melody. It's got to be something that can stick in your head if you want it to. Okay, yeah. and you can you can hum it, you can whistle it. It's got a tune to it. It's just it's just not it's just not an instrumental that's uh, okay. It's got a it's, it's got a tune right. to it, and that's and I always like that. And I remember working up. Uh, Bob or Dan would find some songs and we'd be rehearsing for the album. And I just remember, I, if I haven't heard the song before, you know, I just record what we were doing and I'd go back and come up with as interesting of a break as I could, but not getting too far away from the melody. Now, mm-hmm. it's, it's not like every melody note is in a break, but enough of them that after you kick the song off, when the 
the verse comes up or the chorus and you're going to sing it, if you listen back, you say, well, yeah, that's what he, that's what he kicked it off. That is the melody or to the verse or the chorus of this song. Yeah. You know, and not just some random chords and rolls and licks, you know, licks are great. You find the lick that fits the melody. That, that's, exactly. that's, yeah. that's what I always want to do. Just find something that, so, you know, in music, there's theme and variation. The theme is basically the melody. And I always would, if I got a second break, okay, I'd right. stray a little bit, right, off of it, because now the song's going on, everybody, you, everybody yeah. knows the melody, okay, stray a little bit off of it and put something in there that's off a little bit that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But not really, you know, I never thought, okay, the second break's coming up, man, Watch me. I'm going to put this lick in here. Man, this is going to blow my. I, that, I never cared. I, you know, I just, if I did something a little different and it was kind of, kind of neat, but not just uh, some big old lick, you know, at the end. It's yeah. just like, where did that come from? You know, I, I, that never, that never meant much to me, you know, to do that. Do you, I know I'm, testing your your memory here because this was all a, a few years ago with bob but do you happen to remember any any songs that you were able to do a good job of finding that melody i guess it doesn't even need to be a bob paisley song but just oh. as, a, as a as a demonstration of how to really get that those melodies to to pop i don't know you got a melody of a song that is in your head that uh i mean i, like, I mean it could, it could be anything it could be a, a like, jimmy martin tune like or red river valley Sure. For instance, mm -hmm. okay, you kind of all we all know. Well, I'll, I'll tell you another one is uh, coming around the mountain. Simple. Okay, everybody knows it, right? Pretty much. So, play the melody of that. Incorporate your rolls. There's the melody. So, yeah. so the next time the break comes around, you might play. Or, and just full yeah. with it. But the melody's still there. Sure is. You know. And and that's about as far as I'll stray, as far as variation. I don't I don't have enough <laughs> I don't have enough licks in my pocket to get get up here and, <laughs> and get all crazy, you know. But but yeah, the melody. I just I, in a band situation, the melody is just absolutely important. Well, that's I definitely think. something that people love about your playing. Yeah. So thank you very yeah. much. You, yeah, yeah, you just gotta you, you gotta hit that melody, and you know. Earl did, Crow did, Sonny. I mean, it's right there. Yeah. All you got to do is go back and listen to those guys, and it's 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 all right there, uh -huh. as good as you'll ever get it. Do you remember when and where you heard your first pre-war flathead banjo? Hmm. Well, it would have been Crow. It would have been at that festival. That was the first, I first guess, time I went. I guess I went. when I, uh, you know, the first time you heard it and it, became something that well, you knew was really special and, and wanted to so, pursue. Um, I don't, I don't remember, I probably don't remember that, but I remember that Earl had what, the Granada, okay? Mm -hmm. And that interested me for some reason. As much as learning to play and getting the roles, what he was playing interested me and that whole thing with Gibson just, I don't really, can't really tell you why. It just really... I got I got to learning as much as I could about Gibson banjos and and then the history and I wasn't I remember not being just nuts over Gibsons mm -hmm. but I do remember at, by 76 I wanted a Gibson banjo and I was playing a Fender at mm -hmm. that time Allegro and I wanted a Gibson banjo so I go to Chris Warner's uh place and I can't remember exactly where he was he was uh East Berlin? Yes, I think so. Yeah. 
he had a store. I mean, he had a, he worked at Campbell's in Southern York County for a while, but I think his store, I think it was he's, and uh, I remember going in there and he had a raised head four with a uh, conversion neck on it and he had a gold star. And he said, well, what, well, what, what are you after? I said, well, I want, I'm Gibson, flathead, Gibson, you know, flathead. Well, if you want the flathead sounds, you got to buy the, the uh, gold star. The gold star. I said, yeah, but I want a Gibson worse. So I ended up, <laughs> so I ended up borrowing some money from my grandmother, and, and I bought this for. It turns out it was on consignment from Bill Emerson. Huh. And he had a nice write-up with it, and he used this banjo with, I still have the neck up there from that banjo, but he used that banjo on the Arhuli label record that he made with Del McCurry. And it was Del McCurry's very first album after he left Bill Monroe. Oh, it's just straight ahead, just killer stuff. Yeah, just really good. And Dell told me he says, "Yeah, we recorded that in the in the living room, and the guy that <laughs> recorded it sat on the steps with the with his uh, mixer board in his lap, right. <laughs> sitting on the steps and they were in the living room." So, and I also remember, I'll never forget this. Apparently, I really cared about how to set up the banjo at an early age, only because I remember this story. I'm at the same festival, 76, I think. Five or six, but I think it was six. I'm at the same festival, and seldom seen her playing, right? So they get done, and of course they end with Ryder, right? And then mm-hmm. the place has just gone nuts. So I walk around the back, and they were playing on a, a basically a, a wagon, you know, flatbed, uh, was the stage. And I went back, and I walked up to Ben Eldridge, and I was so nervous. And uh, he said, hi. And I said, hi, can I feel your head? <laughs> and he looked at me and he grins. It's quite a pickup line. And, yeah. And he <laughs> says, that's kind of a personal question, isn't it, son? And I'm so embarrassed. And he's laughing. He's just laughing. And we talked about He knows what's happening. <laughs> we talked about this later. You know, we, we had a lot of fun over that. And, but I did. I wanted to, I wanted to feel the, his, the head tension. Didn't know yeah. anything about a note, G sharp, G. I didn't know anything about that. I learned that from Sonny Osborne later uh, in, I think it was 70, 78 or 9 at Sunset Park. Sonny showed me that. Um, but I didn't know anything about that. I just wanted I just wanted to, you know. Get how, a read on how, it. Yeah. How tight is that? Head? How tight do you keep your head? You know, your banjo sounds like a million bucks to me. Of course, I'm only playing for two years, but so what? It sounds like a million bucks. You know, we're, so, yeah, I was, in, I was into that stuff pretty early. Well, you went to that trade school. You were at least uh, quite a well, bit mechanically well, event- inclined. Eventually, seems, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the trade school. So, yeah, maybe um, I'm getting out of order. Well, so, yeah. So the trade school came at uh, eighty. Uh, I graduated high school in seventy eight. But went, yeah, I went to the went to machining in nineteen eighty, and then uh, was an apprentice toolmaker f- for years and years. And uh, they got they were going to put me on second shift. And I didn't want to go on second shift, so I quit and went to Penn State for mechanical engineering. That was at a satellite campus, and I had every intention of going up the main campus for the last two years and ran out of patience and ran out of money. So mm-hmm. I said, eh, associate's degree is good enough for me. I didn't exactly do, get to where I wanted to get, but it was okay. Hey, everyone. Keith here. I was just chilling in my backyard studio again, and thought I need to tell everyone about our great, great sponsors. The first is Peghead Nation. Peghead Nation is a streaming site to take courses in banjo, guitar, mandolin, fiddle, dobro, upright bass, uke, and through those courses you can learn bluegrass, old time, 
and plenty of other styles from some of the best instructors in all of Roots music. PegheadNation.com features a great lineup of banjo instruction. Here are some of the courses. Beginning bluegrass banjo with Bill Evans. You know him. He also teaches bluegrass banjo. You can learn clawhammer banjo with Evie Layden, Wade Ward style banjo with Bruce Molsky, the banjo according to Danny Barnes, or contemporary bluegrass banjo with Wes Corbett. Now each of these courses include high quality multi-angle video lessons, downloadable notation and tab, play along tracks, and plenty of tunes and songs to play. And the bonus feature of these is that just by being a listener of Picky Fingers, you can get your first month free. Just go to pegheadnation.com, use the promo code PICKYFINGERS at checkout, and you'll get to sample any of these for absolutely free. Picky Fingers is also brought to you in part by Elderly Instruments up in Lansing, Michigan. We all know that it's so much cooler to support small independent businesses, and it really helps out when that independent business also happens to be the most knowledgeable and trusted source around for new used and vintage stringed instruments. And I'm talking, of course, about elderly instruments. They've been family owned and operated since 1972, and you can go to elderly.com to check out their wide selection of all stringed instruments. We're talking all the banjos and banjo accessories and learning products that you could ever want. But if you happen to have a hankering for Let's say electric guitar, acoustic guitar, fiddles, ukes, mandolins, they have all that too. So once again, just go to elderly.com or give them a call at 517-372-7880 to talk to one of their knowledgeable sales representatives. You know, I keep bragging about Michigan, but it's hard not to. If you drive from where a lot of the Motown records were recorded and you drive toward Kalamazoo, which is where all those pre-war Gibson banjos were made, Along the way, you get to Battle Creek, which is the home of GHS Strings, another sponsor of the show. You know, even those pre-war Gibson banjos don't sound like much without a good set of strings on them. And GHS are some of the best, and you know that they're some of the best because they're the ones chosen by players such as Bela Fleck, J.D. Crow, Sonny Osborne, and me. I've been a user of their PF-145 banjo set for quite a few years. And if you need strings for your guitar, mandolin, or any of those other instruments, they're going to have that too. So check out ghsstrings.com for their full selection. The term pre-war banjo is a pretty broad term, and it actually describes, of course, a lot of different types of banjos. And those can vary. I assume you agree you, that those can vary pretty widely in terms of like quality and oh, gosh, yeah. types oh, yeah. of sound and tone. Are you able to articulate what you like to hear or what you do hear and when you hear like the best of the best flatheads out there? I can take a stab at it. It's it's hard it's hard. There's so many terms. Of course. Right? I mean there's just so many terms people use and you're like, okay, so what do you mean by that? Right? And this will be the same thing. I'll I'll have these words that who knows what they mean, but I I'm a pretty good believe a pretty firm believer that if it's a flathead banjo now i won't get too much into the weeds here between two piece and one piece but most flathead banjos were one single flange banjos all right you know I, I, did, I actually didn't prep you on this we do oh. have plenty of banjo nerds out here so get into oh. whatever weeds you feel like people are okay uh, let me start people are into this stuff. okay well let me start this and then i'll get into i'll get into that weed in a minute so most high profile heavyweight rings scruggs ring osborne that type of ring started in 19 19- uh, 29, some before that, maybe a couple, but basically, in general, 1929 with a single-piece flange, okay? So those banjos are the holy grail, basically, because of Scruggs, Reno, Sonny, JD, okay? They're all using these banjos. And I think they all they all don't sound the same, obviously, right? okay? You, I can even remember ones that I didn't really like that much. But at this point, after all, after these all these years of doing this, I'm a pretty much of a believer that if it's a pre-war flathead banjo, mm-hmm. if it's not cutting it, it's because of the neck that's in the banjo. 
Mm. All right. And, and set up. Let me say set up first. Okay. If it's okay. not set up to, to your liking. Okay. So what is set up? What's the right setup? Well, gosh, we could spend an hour on that. Okay. I learned set up from Sonny. I learned, I played his banjo. I played J.D. Crow's banjo many, many, many times. I would be taking notes on where to put the head, the action, things like that. And then just experience from 1950 banjos so far. So you're going to learn something, right, <laughs> from just setting every one of them up. I would hope so, yeah. And tweaking them in and, and, uh, and all that. So, you know, setup is a, there's the right bow in the neck, which is part of setup, that you don't want it too high, you don't want it too low. It's just the right. But there's still variables. There's head tension is the biggest variable. There's no other instrument where you can change the sound of your banjo so drastically with a couple turns on 24 nuts. Yeah. Okay, it's just, it's amazing. Or the bridge. Put a heavy bridge on it, put a thin bridge on it, you drastically change the sound of this banjo. So there's so much to do. And, and I have... I have a setup that I like, okay? And you probably do too. And everybody should. I don't think you should just say, hey, there's there's one setup, you know, Huber's setup, that's the way a banjo should be set up. Well, that's not true. You know, you can, Ron Bach, Block plays a looser head. Sammy Schiller plays a little looser head, you know, Bayless. Uh, and there's not there's nothing wrong with any of that. It's a, it's a sound and it's a nice sound and it's 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 great. I have a preference of what I want to hear out of a banjo, and that's fine. And if you have a preference, and guys will come here and pick up a new banjo, and I, I like it when they come to pick it up. That's the best. And some of them just want me to set it up the way I would set it up, and they are happy. Okay? Yeah. Other guys, I try to say, look, what do you hear when you're playing this? Well... And if I can get them to be honest with me, because half of them are, are afraid to say anything in front of me, right? right? But I just, no, just be honest. Well, maybe maybe it's a little harsh. Okay, fine. You know, they're not used to a G-sharp head, so I bring the head down for them. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's fine. Because they're buying the banjo. I want them to be happy. Of course. And I've told every customer that I've had, there's none of us making any money. There's just a handful of people making money playing banjo, okay? Everybody else is doing it for one reason only, to be happy, period. So be happy. Don't worry about so much. You know, if you like, if you like your head a little looser, Earl even commented on it. Earl called it a couch banjo or a room banjo. Hmm. He, he was known for saying, and that was a banjo with a little looser head because it wasn't a stage banjo. Okay. And... It's all good. It's all good. There's yeah. just not... Um, my favorite story happened about four years ago, maybe. Uh, Melvin Cumbie brought J.D. Crow over, and J.D. Crow is sitting right over there in that, that chair, and we're talking about head tension, and, and Melvin or I mentioned G-sharp, and J.D. says, Huber, that G-sharp stuff's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and we just busted up laughing. <laughs> I said, J.D., I says, what do you mean? <laughs> and I said, J.D., let me tell you. I said, every time, going back to 1980, whatever, after I learned about a G-sharp note on a banjo, yeah. and I could hear it, okay, I said, every time I played your banjo, <laughs> you, right you, there. you were right there or so <laughs> close to it. And, and it was, and that's the truth. Uh -huh. But J.D., would take his thumb and he would just push on the head. And he'd know how tight that head needs to be Yeah, by doing that and playing it, obviously. he knew know what he wanted out of the banjo and how it should sound, okay? But he knew exactly where he wanted it, I can tell you that. Because all those decades that I would now and again play J.D.'s banjo, it was right there. Now, I never got to play it when he's with the Kentucky Mountain Boys or anything like that. I only got to play it probably after 1984, three yeah. or four, okay, when I first played it and looked at it. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, that's what, just one of my favorite stories. I wish I had a video <laughs> yeah, camera that's going. Great. <laughs> that's great. To go back, it sounds like you think that any of those pre-war flatheads all have at least that potential. Absolutely, I really do. Now, okay, I, 
there was one, I'm not going to mention the banjo, there was one original five-string um, that, I mean, maybe taking the original five-string neck off, putting something else on might have made that banjo great. But that, that one I could never just get to where I thought it should be. Hmm. And it, it very well could have been a neck, but you're not going to take the neck off an original five-string and put another neck just on it. I mean, around, you, yeah. you would if you're going to save the neck so you don't break it and you play the banjo. I did that with mine for a while. I had a uh, I had a Frank Neat neck on my banjo for a while, and then I just went back to the original. But yeah, I, I, I believe that. I believe when they're set up right, because there's all kinds of things. I mean, you can have your head just right, but you might just you might have a head that's not working. It's not every head there, and I don't know how you tell. I haven't figured out how to tell a good head from a bad head. But I know if I can, I put a new head on a banjo. I know if it's not doing what I do, I just go grab another one, and it's probably probably going to work. Yeah. Now that doesn't happen often. They're Remo, Remo's very very consistent. But there's so many there's so many things. With the setup of a banjo, but yeah, I I absolutely believe that if you got the rim and ring came from the factory mm -hmm. together, yeah, you got a good banjo. You just got. We're we're definitely going to talk more about those those components and everything. But what do you think it is that like a really good pre war flathead? What are they capable of that so, other banjos are not? Response number. I'm I'm not going to say number one. I'm just going to list some things. I don't know which is more. Right. But response is. Absolutely, one of them, and you just it, you just touch it and it just goes. You know, it's just it's there. You don't have to play it hard. You can, and if you do, that's the other thing they do. They don't give out at all. There's no you can't bottom it out, yeah. kind of so to speak. You can't overplay it. You just play it and it just keeps saying, <laughs> keeps "Oh, you're gonna louder. play that hard? Well, here, take this," right. and it just fights right back. Huh. And uh, uh, I don't know where I got this term. Somebody used it one time. I liked it, but it was it, it's called fight. It'll fight back. Interesting. And, but you don't have to do that. But if you do, you're fine. You know. But a banjo in general, even even flatheads, you can play them hard and they're not going to give up. But you can overplay any banjo. You can just overplay it and play too hard. Okay, mm -hmm. as far as the t tone goes. Now the banjo might not give out on you, but it you know it's better to have a medium touch, you know, you just don't want to have a, a just really, really be bearing down all the time. That affects tone. There's a sweet spot unless there. You like yeah. that, unless you like that tone, then it's okay, right? <laughs> of so, course, yeah. I mean, all, all of this is contingent on it, unless you like it like that. Yeah, yeah. it's all subjective. It's, yeah. It really is. So uh, uh, so what else? So they're evenness. Evenness across the strings, one to five, and, and evenness from the nut to the 22nd fret. You play a note, it's just there. It's just the same. It has the same intensity. It has the same response. Yeah. It's, yeah, complexity. There's a word that you say, what's that mean? Okay. Right. But it's a good word because when you, if you don't know what it means, then, and if you've played banjo long enough, then play, play a newer banjo and then play an old one and if you are been playing long enough to hear little intricacies, then you will know what the word complex means because that note in a good old flathead, that's just what it is. It's just there's got so much going on to it. Yeah. It's, just not, it's just not a note. I hear that word used a lot with flavors of food, and I think that's a, maybe a pretty decent analogy that mm -hmm. like a really good wine has a complex flavor and you mm -hmm. can get these... You know, cigars, the typical wine taste. Cigars too. Cigars too. Yeah. Maybe bourbons too. Yeah. Yeah. And, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I enjoy cigars, and but I cannot tell you the complexities of a cigar like I can with a banjo. I was not right. gifted with a palate that will say, "Oh, this cigar has." I, I taste the chocolate cake. I, <laughs> right. Oh, I taste the. Uh, oh, I taste the cucumber. Right. I mean, there's guys that they'll say that. But, but even if you can't put your finger on what that flavor is, there's there's still going to be a sense well, that this is better than just a bunch of yeah. dried up leaves that I raked up, wrapped. Uh, well, the, yeah. the joke is where I smoke cigars uh -huh. is uh, ask Steve what he thinks of a cigar, and he'll tell you it tastes like burnt leaves. That, <laughs> that's the joke because I don't I don't have the I don't have the. Are palate. you sure you actually like cigars? Then if I'm that's not, what you I'm think. I'm not sure. Them. I think now I'm now it's a habit. I think I'm down to the point where it's a habit. Yeah. Oh brother! Yeah. Oh boy. 
So um, one more thing I have to do in my life is get over that. But so so given all these attributes of these, you know, holy grail flatheads, and given your fascination with it, and the fact that you have this banjo business going, I'm really fascinated by the story around the development of your True Tone series. So okay. can you can you tell us about what? experiments and research went into yeah. designing that stuff. So 96, I'll make this quick. So uh, I'm playing with a band. I moved to town in 93, November 93, to Nashville from Pennsylvania. Um, I got with a band called Lonesome Standard Time, Glenn Duncan, Larry Cordell, and that was huge for me. It was like, wow, I got in this great band. This is going to be great. So, And it was. It was, it was just It was fascinating. I loved it. And I felt, you know, wow, I come to Nashville and I made it right got a gig. <laughs> I got a gig. and uh and butch baldessari is on the mandolin and oh god i miss that guy he was such a good fella what a and a great mandolin player but what what a good guy anyway so we're getting to the point that we're going to start flying so i had bought in 1987 after i joined bob paisley I was at a festival in New Hampshire, and I find a this guy at the music store, Dave Del Rossi, has a. Uh, I says, "Man, are there any old flatheads around here?" Right? He's got a music store. It's at the festival. Nobody's there yet. It's early. We're there early. He's setting up. Yeah, I got one. I said, "What do you got?" Because I got a seventy-five flathead seventy-five. I said, "You're kidding." He goes, "Yeah." I, he says, "You want to? You want to see it?" I said, "Of course." He says. Well, if you want to play it on stage, you can too. I don't care. Just take it and go ahead and do what you want with it and whatever. And I've just met the guy, right? He's yeah. I'm thinking you're nuts. You've given me a. <laughs> but also, don't have to ask me twice. Of course, I will. <laughs> exactly. So the head was really, really tight. So I, I brought the head down a little bit, and, and uh, I don't think I, I can't remember if I played it on stage or not. I may have, but I don't. I don't remember. So. Um, but you spent some time with it. Oh, yes. Oh, spent a lot of time with it and looked at it. You want to sell this? No. I said, uh, well, uh, do you have the tenor neck? No. Oh, I said, too bad. He says, well, why would I? It's a five string. I said, it's a five string. He says, yeah, it's original five string. I have the, he had a neck on it uh, that had, didn't have the same inlays, had some kind of a, kind of a, uh, a leave, a vine pattern in the neck. Okay. Just a newer neck. But he says, yeah, I have the original neck. So, but the original neck is a five string. Oh yeah, it's that one right there on the the picture on the wall. So it had a top tension style peg head, uh, bow tie top tension inlays, but it was a seventy five, and the neck was not made for top tension because it didn't have the uh, forty five degree angles between the tension hoop that you have to have on a top tension, and it was made for that banjo. So it turns out that's so far that's the only one they made like that, which was was cool. So we went back and forth for years. He had it for sale. I didn't have the money. I saved up some money. He didn't have it for sale. Back and forth and back and forth we went until one day he said, well, eh. I said, you like Martin guitars? He goes, yeah. I says, how about I get you a 54 Martin guitar that I know I can get in pretty good shape. Might need a neck set maybe. But I said, uh, that and some cash. Yeah, I think I'd be interested in that. So we made the deal. Yeah. And I, and I got the banjo in, in 87, played it, sold it in 2005. Where were we going with that? That <laughs> we, I, I had <laughs> asked you about True Tone. True Tone. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I got off. So uh, I had that banjo, okay, yeah. when I'm with on some standard time. Well, I'm not flying with that banjo at all. There's no way. Right. So I'm going to put together something I can fly with. So I just pull this thing apart, and I know enough about metallurgy just to be dangerous, okay? I'm no expert at all. Knew enough about things. I take the tone ring. I'm hitting on it. I'm weighing it. I'm measuring it. I'm dinging it. And in 1994, there wasn't a ton of tone rings you could buy. Right. All right. But I bought every one different tone ring I could find, and nothing sounded like this tone ring. And I'm saying, when I say sound like it, I'm hanging it on my finger. I'm taking a screwdriver handle, screwdriver, and holding it by the metal part and hitting it with the plastic part of screwdriver hammer and listening to it uh -huh. ring. Nothing sounded like it. Oh, well. Maybe I can make. And what the, was it ringing like more sustain uh, or no, the no, richness no. of the tone no, itself? It's, it, well, there is a little sustain going on with one of the higher pitch notes that is distinctive to pre-war rings. Okay, but it's actually it's not how long it rings. People get that like people say. Well, 
we want bell brass, like like you'd use in a bell. Mm -hmm. That's exactly not what you want to use to make a tone ring. Mm -hmm. Although it's been written about all over the place that yes, you want to use a bell bronze, but that's not what Gibson used. So now I had a challenge, and I had uh, I knew enough about machining that machining a tone ring would be is, is not is no big deal. But I have to reverse engineer this. I want to make one that sound the same, and that's what started me making tone rings in in '96. And so. Uh, I called that the I called that the quote unquote vintage ring. I just needed a name. I made that uh, started making banjos in 2000. Made rings. Left my I had an engineering job. Left my engineering job because there was a change at the factory where I worked. Uh, new boss, new uh, management, and it was not good. Okay. So I said, okay. I'm going to leave anyway, and, and, but I'm going to leave and I'm going to make tone rings. And if that doesn't pan out, I'm just going to get another engineering job because had the tone rings not been in the picture, I would have left that job anyway. So I'm not going to sit here and say- Made your choice easy. I was making so many tone rings, I quit my job. No, uh -huh. that wasn't the case. <laughs> so, but, so I did. I, I left it and it turned out that I made tone rings for, for three years and that was my job. And wow. just just sold a lot of them. Enough. I was living by myself. I didn't have a lot of expenses. No kids, no wife. Okay. So had the machines in the garage, made tone rings, set up a plate, the plating. I needed to plate them myself. I had the first couple plated at a plater's. Well, they came back like a car bumper. Uh -huh. I mean, the plating was so thick. So I just got lucky and found a guy that knew how to set up plating, and he just passed away last year. He was uh, 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 Bob Wright, what a wonderful man. And was he working for you and, this whole time? Uh, no, 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 no. He just it? set me up with the plating. Okay. He, well, he loved country music. He loved bluegrass, yeah. and he, he showed me how to set up the plating. He taught me everything I know about plating, and I'm not going to say it's that much, but it's enough that I can do it, yeah. you know, do a good job at it. And, and he was uh, – so set up a little plating in my garage, had the lathe, got the rings cast, and figured out what I had to do to make the ring sound like the ring that was in my 75. In 75. All right, now. Now, real, real quick question. Yeah. Uh, this is a little bit before I got into this whole banjo universe. At that time, w were your rings pretty much the only sort of good aftermarket well, item of that type? No, or? there were, I mean, Sullivan made a good ring. Okay. Okay. I don't know um, if they were individually available gosh. like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. I remember buying three or four. Uh, I wish I could tell you what they were. Um, maybe a Janzinger might have been one of them. Um, was Danik already doing? Um, I don't think so. Okay. No, I don't. I'm not sure I was just sure wondering. I didn't that. have that frame of yeah. reference to know. And if they were, I didn't get, I don't think I got, but I don't know. I don't think so okay. at that time. So... I reversed engineered this thing, figured out the alloy, and then figured out how to pour it to get the alloy, because what you start with is not what you get um, because of burn off and all that. So that was, that was fun. So that ring was, now let me say this. To this day, I don't make a pre-war ring, all right? I'm still working on it, okay? I found out some things that I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going the next step. Okay, I don't, know, right. don't I, know if it's going to work. I don't know if it's going to work, but I did find out some stuff that's really cool that I want to try to incorporate. So I'm, I've, been working on, I've been working on this, what we'll call it, next generation yeah. ring, and it's either going to sound like a, like a, like a pre-war, I mean, dead nuts, or I'm not coming out with it. Mm -hmm. I'm not just going to come out with something new all the time. Hey, this is new ring. You know, the, the HR30 is really, really close right. to a pre-war ring. I'm really proud of that ring. Um, and again, rings are subjective. There's a lot of good rings out there, really good rings, yeah. okay? I'm not sitting here telling you mine's the best. I'm not going to do that. I just, it's the best that I can make. It's the closest to my ears. Doesn't mean it's the closest to your ears. That's fine. My gosh, if everybody wanted mine, I couldn't keep up anyway. So, you know, what the heck? Right. Uh, but, uh, so back to your question. So I had the vintage ring. Then I met a guy named Dr. Ray. And if you're interested to read this in detail, you can go to my website, huberbanjos.com. It's, it's all there. But Dr. Ray, what a, what a genius. He, uh, he, he worked at Mayo Clinic, and he worked in proteins in the eyeball. That's what he did. And he invented a machine 
that measured some kind of proteins in the eyeball. That was a huge, big deal. Him and another guy invented this machine, and uh-huh. the royalties off that were great for him, you know, and yeah. just a genius. But he played banjo, too. And he came up with this vibrating measurement, the measure vibrations device. So long story short, we would he, he brought it here twice. We would set up with rims out of pre-wars, and he would measure the vibrations, he would vibrate the rim, measure it in all these different places from, uh, I don't know how what hertz we went up to, zero to so many hertz, I can't remember right now, 2,000 maybe. And then he would have this all plotted out on a right. graph of what all the this did of the response when we would input, what did we get output? Exactly. All right, And we did it for rims and we did it for tone rings. Well, that actually told us a lot of data. Uh-huh. It was amazing what he, he would read this stuff and he'd come back and say, here's what, here's what we're doing. Well, we started on the rim, and uh, which I call an engineered rim. Well, the reason it's engineered is it's gone off Dr. Ray's data. And then Brian Sims, who makes my rims, he was, he, you know, wood, every piece of wood's different in the world. It's just a different piece of wood. So he would get it and he would, uh, you know, maybe he'd, soak it for so long, and then he'd pick a certain hardness of wood or a certain, you know, a piece of wood will ring if you ring it, if you tap on it and just hold it from the very top and ring on it, it'll have a note. Well, so Brian and Doc Ray, they started, he, Brian would make rims with certain pieces of wood with certain qualities that we could measure until it would, it would get as close as we could to the same vibration patterns yeah. as what Doc had on the pre-wars. Now, the pre-wars obviously aren't all the same. It's wood. Sure. But they did have a nice characteristic. Now, can you get there? Can you make a new rim sound like an old pre-war rim? I haven't. Got got close, and I think it's right. I think it's a darn good rim. But what are you gonna do? You got eighty years of age. You just can't you just can't copy that. There's no way. And they're they're all different, but if I remember um correctly from your write up online, you you are specifically finding the best sounding assembled banjos and using those for your data oh, points oh, yeah, yeah. so that you only had the, it was, oh, oh, was pretty well, selected to it, be the nicest ones. It was. Well, nicest ones to me. Sure. Okay. Now, if right. another guy did this, he may have picked uh-huh. another bunch of banjos, but I picked the ones that I thought were just great mm-hmm. banjos. And and it, and it turns out that the old, the old one piece rims, you know, they're kind of doing the same thing uh, in general. All right. They're not, 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 there's no two of them the same. And we did the same with the tone ring. So I started messing with my vintage ring as far as a couple, one additive, and how many gates and risers we used to pour it, how long it stayed. Now, I'm not going to get into due details here because it's, you know. Proprietary. Proprietary, right? Top freaking secret. Yeah. <laughs> right? but, but, I mean, there's a few things I'm not going to mention, but in general, it's all known. But it, it's, how, it's how long you cool it how you pour it, how the metal reacts when you're pouring it, what temperature you're pouring at, and on and on and on, on all these things. That Every we, variable. That we don't know what they did in the old days. I mean, I know how they poured it. I'm, I know I don't know the temperature they poured at it, but I know what they used. I know the machinery and the equipment they used back then. I mean, I studied, tried to study that, but I don't know exactly how uh, Star Brass Company poured those rings for Gibson in, you know, starting in 2026. 20, but like you said, and this whole thing is a reverse engineered so, yeah, process. Yeah. So, so, but we did come up with a few changes in the vintage ring. I mean, we tested. Gosh, we put this ring in so many different banjos. The vintage ring, take it out, put the HR30 in it, take yeah. that out, put it in this one, put it in that one, until we're blue in the face. And I heard a difference in the HR30 than I did the vintage ring. Uh-huh. And I heard enough of a difference that I wanted to come out with that new ring. I thought it was... I could have said, well, here's the new improved vintage ring, or here's this ring. A whole distinct product. And yeah. I chose the product, and I called HR for Huber Ray, for ours for Dr. Ray. Right. And uh, I don't know where the 30 came from, 1930 maybe. I think that's it. So I needed a number, so I <laughs> picked a number. <laughs> uh, so that's how the true tone stuff come about. It, yeah. was, it, was, it, was really, it was really through Dr. Ray and his love of banjos and his generosity and his just he just wanted to know he wanted to know as bad as i did yeah you it's know? fascinating yeah the, the guy uh, boy and bridges gosh he would make bridges out of 
every known wood in existence and to hear what the different woods and bridges did. Is he still around? It's amazing. He is. Okay. He's still around. Um, And uh, uh, yeah, I saw him in Texas a couple years ago when I played down there. He showed up at the show. It was really great to see him. Is he down there uh, now? He's not in uh, Minnesota anymore? uh, His son was in Texas. I think he was down visiting us, I think. So here's an interesting side note. Here's mm-hmm. some behind the scenes baseball. Dr. Ray, when he was in, he's an incredible golfer. So he has the ability of muscle control to do the same thing over and over and over and over. So he hit 500 foul shots in a row at his college one evening, and it's still the, still the record at the college. I don't remember which college he was at. 500 free throws. In a row. Oh, free th- okay. Free throws. I'm I thought you said golfer. No, he was. He's a great golfer. But that's, okay. But that's why he's a great golfer. Muscle memory. Okay. All right? You had to hit, the, hit the ball. You do the same thing every time. Yeah. He could do it. He had that. So, but when that's he was amazing. in college, 500 free throws in All a right. row, he missed 501. And I said, Doc. He goes. He was tired. <laughs> he says, I really honestly think I wanted to. I wanted to miss it. He he didn't. He said I didn't miss it on purpose, but he kind of thinks he might have. But the gym, he started this. He said, "Yeah, I was making fifty in a row." He says there was there was like thirty five, forty, fifty people there. He says by the time he got the five hundred, the word got out because that was a long time. He said the gym was packed, and he had that pressure not yeah. to miss four hundred and ninety nine. Right? <laughs> How crazy! I'm so glad that people like that get into banjos to solve some of these problems so, for oh. us. Yeah, Just absolutely. This really yeah, who almost would've... neurotic obsession with that yeah, stuff. Who would have known? Yeah, that's really so, cool. Yeah, nice, nice little song. That's going to do it for part one of my interview with Steve Huber of Huber Banjos. You heard some song clips in this episode in order. They were Dancing in the Boat by Steve Huber, Rider performed by The Seldom Seen, no Vacancy by Bob Paisley and the Southern Grass, and Prisoner Song by a much younger Del McCurry. Thank you once again to today's Patreon supporter of the show. That's Banjo Ben Clark. Head to patreon.com slash banjo podcast to find out how you can support the show. Contact the show at pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com. I hope to see you all either at Delfest or IBMA or the Great Lakes Music Camp. Looking forward to each of those. And if you are at one of those locations, track me down and say, hey, that's going to do it for me. You all take care out there and I will see you next time. Mm-hmm.